So my name is Yuri Doolin, and I was born in 1988, and um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. My earliest childhood memories were of South Korea. I was born actually on Loring Air Force Base in Maine, but then really shortly after my birth, my parents moved back to Korea. They lived around Osan Air Force Base in um, Songtan. So my earliest memories are actually of me being with my mom in our house and, you know, walking around the Songtan marketplace, you know, just basically spending time with my mom. Those are my earliest um, childhood memories in Korea. During the 1980s, my dad was stationed in South Korea and he met my mother in uh, a military camp town. So in Songtan near Osan Air Base. Growing up, actually, I didn't have much information about how it was that they met um, because they divorced when I was three years old and my father was not around and my mother was very secretive about her past and didn't like to talk about that time in her life. I think one of the reasons why I later became so interested in history was because it was a way for me to fill in the gaps and blank spaces in that narrative and to try to understand how it was that my mother and father came to know one another um, and how it was that sort of uh, me and you know, the other mixed race Koreans that I knew um, you know, came into existence. So we moved from Korea kind of abruptly because my parents um, decided they were going to get divorced and my mom had sort of made all of these plans in secret from my father to run away with us um, into the Korean countryside where he could never find us again. Or that's at least his side of the story. So he caught wind of this because she was selling all of the furniture in the house in Songtan and he got emergency leave to come to um, find us and to take us to the United States. And so he snuck in one night he says my mom was not home because she was, you know, at some church function or something. And he knew she was going to be gone. And so he, he um, came into the house and he told me and my brother to come with him. Yeah, he flew us to the States that night. From his perspective, his side of the story, he says that he did it because he was scared that she was actually going to you know, run away with us in the Korean countryside and that he would never see us again. And he wanted to make sure that the divorce did happen in the United States. So after that, my father had to go back to Korea, right? It was only a temporary emergency leave. My mother, I think, found out where we were. She had to come to the US um, and find her way there. So she actually went to Michigan where my emo was living at the time. So she went to her sisters. So we lived in Cleveland, Ohio, with our paternal grandparents, me and my brother, um, until my mom was able to sort of get an apartment together for us and, and find stable work. And I remember after we were reunited with her for the first time um, after that period, I didn't remember who she was. Um, and my brother turned to me and he said, like, what are you, stupid? Like, that's our mom. You don't know who that, who that is? I think it was just because I was so young, you know, and, and, and it was such a big change. And I think that was actually quite traumatic for my mom. She talks about that time a lot. But so she recalls that time and I think it's very painful for her, but she has a lot of animosity towards, um, actually my paternal grandmother. At the time, my mother saw her and I, I guess, you know, saw that I viewed my paternal grandmother sort of as my mother and was very upset about that. My mother raised us sort of as she knew how, which was completely and wholly Korean. And so everything about our household was kept in sort of a Korean way and a Korean fashion. And actually in the courts, she won full custody. So my father resumed his military service and was kind of always away. And he was kind of out of the picture. So we very rarely saw him. So he had really little influence on our upbringing and our childhood and of course our household. And my mom uh, maintained full control of that stuff. You know, I just thought I was fully Korean. And in many ways I thought that being Korean was superior because my mother often talked about how Koreans, you know, were the cleanest, the smartest, had the best food, the healthiest. So I really in many ways thought that 
Koreans were superior. So growing up, um, we attended Korean church. I was around Korean Americans more or less every Sunday. That was really a place where I felt very comfortable as a Korean American in Cleveland, Ohio. But it wasn't actually until I got to undergraduate in college, I attempted to enter a Korean student association meeting. And I remember that my presence was instantly questioned, like, um, what are you doing here? Who are you? Who do you know? And I was just really confused. Um, I didn't know why they were asking me those things. I didn't know why I wasn't obviously Korean to them. That was, I think, a moment that I realized that I was actually mixed race, rather Korean. And at the same time as that was happening, I um, enrolled in an Asian American history class. And, you know, I actually enrolled in this class haphazardly. I thought that Asian American history meant like U.S.-Asia relations. And so I enrolled in that Asian American history class and I learned who and what Asian Americans were and were about. That class in combination with sort of meeting mixed Koreans and creating a mixed race student organization is where I think I really developed my identity as a mixed race Asian American. And it kind of became my goal and purpose to bridge Asian American studies and mixed race students and Asian American students on Ohio State campus. So we would do a lot of programming with Asian American Studies program. From sort of a final paper on mixed Koreans and the history of mixed Koreans, I decided to expand that into a senior thesis. And I went to Korea and I wanted to meet mixed Koreans that were my age who had grown up in Korea. And it was really premised on this personal question of what my life would have been like had I remained in Korea instead of coming to the United States. Um, and I think back to that moment where, you know, my father says, you know, my mother was selling all the belongings in the apartment and she was planning on running away with us in the Korean countryside. And, and sort of he swooped in to take us to Ohio instead, where the divorce happened in the States instead. And I think about what if he hadn't done that? What if he had been um, a little bit late? What if my mom had been successful um, and we had grown up in Korea? How would our lives have been different? So that was sort of the personal question at the core of that honors thesis project. I remember just feeling at that at that time when I was interviewing those mixed race Koreans, like I was looking at the person I could have become. So I think I decided that I wanted to drop my pre-med major and be a historian um, in that first Asian American history class as I was doing that research for mixed Koreans. And it was sort of as I was reading Beyond the Shadow of Camp Town, it was a book about Korean military brides. And as I was reading that book, I realized what history was and what history could be. The knowledge I took away was really powerful. It really shaped my relationship with my mom moving forward. You know, I understood her as an immigrant woman of color. I understood her as somebody who had a past before she had children. <laughs> I understood my mother as somebody dealing with the traumas and disappointments of her own life. And I came to terms with all of that and I fully accepted it. That kind of knowledge really improved our relationship immediately. I was more compassionate. I was able to understand where she was coming from. I was able to understand why she was the way she was, why she was doing the things that she had done um, in our childhood. And I wanted to write the book that would do that for some other young person another day in the future. So I started graduate school at Northwestern in 2012. And it was in the history department. And fortunately that year, we had a lot of students of color. I found a really great group at Northwestern that allowed sort of me to bring critical Asian American storytelling to our shows. I wanted to sort of bring a more critical political aspect um, to those shows. And so I was really lucky that the students at Northwestern were really receptive to that. And we produced some really amazing shows and I'm really, really proud of that opportunity. It was just, you know, I was so lucky to have that, you know, to be able to combine dance and performance with Asian American studies like that.
The first show we did that I think really pushed the boundaries um, that was sort of present in the South Asian American dance circuit was we staged a show that was about LGBTQ issues. I think we treated the topic very seriously. The protagonist was, um, you know, a person who was dealing with this struggle and dealing with the coming out process with an immigrant parent. And of course, I drew from my own personal experiences in sort of writing that character and the script for that character. It was a very serious show in tone, even though it was um, set to the aesthetics of Bollywood dance. And it struck a very different chord than I think what a lot of um, dance groups were sort of um, performing at that time. We had South Asian choreographers and sort of my perspective on Asian American studies. We were able to bring it all together to create a really, um, I think, beautiful show that a lot of people noticed. You know, I actually was most scared, I think, from my mother's reaction. And she was very, like most Korean Americans, very Christian. You know, her reaction actually was way better than I ever thought it would be. Um, she was very upset, but she did let me know like immediately that I was her son and she loved me and that would never change. But she kind of talked about it as if it was a big problem that we were going to deal with. And so, <laughs> Um, over time, I think she, um, I mean, I think it's still a work in pro progress to be, you know, quite honest. Um, I think it's hard for her. She didn't grow up with, you know, seeing gay people out in the open in South Korea. I don't think coming out is really a strategy that they've employed historically. Um, so there's an entirely different culture of being gay and what coming out means in the United States. Her solution was, you know, just to marry anyway, <laughs> that kind of a thing. And yeah, I mean, I try to be patient in, in that, but it, it's hard. it is hard sometimes. I feel like I've tried so hard to understand her um, through my scholarship, my work, you know, my academic inquiry. All of my intellectual creative pursuits are really, you know, at, at its core about knowing her and about having a Korean mother and what that means and what it meant to have a Korean mother um, growing up in the U.S., but not only a Korean mother, a Korean mother who was married to a U.S. military personnel, um, a Korean mother who was divorced and, and because of those reasons is marked a certain way by other Korean Americans and, and Americans. So yeah, I think for me, it is a little disappointing sometimes, but it's a work in progress. When I approach historical scholarship, I really want to make sure that my work is accessible and that I have not only academic audiences in mind, but students in mind or people who are searching for answers to questions about their own lives or their own experiences. My current book is about mixed race Koreans who were born in the 1940s and 1950s and who were placed for adoption into American homes. I realized they don't have a lot of answers to questions about how it was they were separated from their Korean mothers. And it's helped me realize the importance of scholarship in my work because if I'm successful, my book will answer a lot of those questions for them. Once we acquire that kind of knowledge, I think it could be really emancipatory and you can really come to have closure and um, appreciation for your life and your experience and feel validated in your experiences. So doing that kind of work and working with oral history narrators has really, I think, influenced the way that I write and do history. My name is Yuri Doolin, and this is my Korean American story. Mm -hmm.